Hello students, this is Professor Ryan Paul, and this lecture is on the idea of myth. What is myth? So in this lecture, I'm attempting to explore some of the questions about what myths are, what they do. Why do we have myths? Why does every culture have a mythology? What purpose do these myths serve in our cultures and in our lives? The most common definition of myth, and really it's a misunderstanding, a misdefinition, is that myths are things that are false. They're fictional. They're lies. They're fake stories that were made up. And usually this definition of myth is closely tied to a sort of religious idea. That is, that myths are a false religion or a fake religion or a religion of a primitive religion that is not true, that's not based on the correct religion or truth. Now, there are a lot of problems with that definition, but the main one that concerns me is that it creates an us versus them mentality. That is, they believe in myths. They are wrong. The ancient Greeks, the ancient Romans, whoever. Their beliefs are false, but our beliefs are not myths. They're not mythological. We're right. Our beliefs are objectively true. That's, again, the problem with thinking of myth just as something that's false. A much better definition of myth has nothing to do with truth or falsity. It has nothing to do with what's real or not real, what's fact or fiction. It understands myth instead as stories that are important, that are meaningful, that have some value to a culture because they express what the people of that culture believe in. And so myths then connect the people in that culture and they define the essence of that culture. And that's a much better understanding of myth that we're going to use in this class. And myths are important because they help us to understand the complex reality around us. We have myths, any culture has a myth or a mythology because it tells us what's real. It helps us to understand how the world works. And it teaches us how to fit in, not only to our cultures, to our societies, but also our place in the world around us, the universal, the universe around us. And these myths then pass on these cultural values from generation to generation. It's a way that a culture, a society, a civilization reproduces itself over time. And that's the importance of myth. So every culture has a mythology. To give you an example from modern American mythology, one of the great myths of America is that it's a land of opportunity. We tell ourselves and we tell our children, you can be whatever you want when you grow up. But is this really true? Is this objectively true? Can any single person who's born in the United States today, no matter their parents, their race, their sexuality, their economic status, can they really grow up to be whatever they want? Well, probably not. We know from our own experiences that there are many doors that are closed to us because of certain circumstances of our life. We can't all be famous rock stars or the president of the United States or astronauts or whatever it might be. But that's not saying that the myth is a lie. In fact, the myth's important not because it's true or false, not because literally every single person could be whatever they want, because we know that's not objectively true. What's important is that it promotes a certain set of values. It gives us a way of looking at the world that defines us as Americans. And in fact, it tells us what we want to be as Americans. It's not an objective description of the real world, but rather a way of understanding our relationship to the real world, a way of trying to exist in the real world. So it's not about whether this is literally true for every single person or not, but what it gives us as Americans and helps us to understand about ourselves and our world. And so it's very important to understand that by this definition, all religions and all religious texts and stories are mythological. They are 
all myths. And they are all myths not because they're true or false. You may believe in a certain religion and disbelieve in another, but they're both mythological. Not because one's true and one's false or both are false or whatever, but because the religious belief and the religious text expresses the values that define that religious community and how its members interpret the world around them. So all religions are mythological, but that's not a statement about whether they're true or false. So, what kind of stories do myths tell? Myths, and especially ancient myths, the kind we're going to be focusing on in this class, they tell origin stories often. They talk about how the world or the universe was created. Or they might talk about the foundation of great cities or great nations. The story of the American Revolution, regardless of the facts that are presented in that story, is a myth in a certain sense because it gives us an idea of how America was born and what it means to be American. They tell the births of gods and heroes. Where did they come from? And they might also tell us about the origin of various features of the natural world, like how a mountain got there or why a certain bird is a certain color, things like that. So origin stories are really common in myths. Myths also can tell what I'm calling heroic stories. And these are not necessarily distinct from origin stories. They might be very closely connected or intertwined or really the same story in some cases. They tell about the, the great exploits of gods and heroes. And as you'll see in the ancient myths of, of Greece and Rome, those exploits are not necessarily what by our standards would be considered very honorable. Uh, many of the gods do things that we might find very troubling. Uh, they tell about legendary conflicts and battles. And again, these might be conflicts and battles that lead to the origins of certain things. And they can tell about quests for glory and wealth, struggles, strife, sufferings of great legendary figures. So these heroic stories about important characters. Now these stories all communicate different types of values. Origin stories, for example, talk about foundational principles, things that help us understand the world around us and our place in that world. So, for example, what are the forces that govern the cosmos, govern the reality? Is it governed by love or is it governed by conflict or perhaps the interaction of love and conflict? Is the world, is the universe governed by chaos or by order or again by some mix of chaos and order? Again, this is very important for understanding how the world works. These are foundational values that help us understand how we live in the world. They can also be the values that define a particular nation or people. One nation is, is defined by its bravery, another by its warlike nature, and so on and so forth. And ultimately, these are about the forces that shape the lives and histories of humanity. So these are the kinds of things that origin stories can communicate. Heroic stories, similarly, can communicate values about how humans live in the world. What does it mean to be good or bad? What defines a good life or a worthy life or not an unworthy life? What are the sorts of things that we should strive to achieve versus the kinds of actions that we should avoid? And as you'll see when we start looking at these myths, the ancient Greek and Roman ideas about right and wrong, good and bad, are often very different from ours. Uh, they have a different understanding of what makes life worthwhile, what our purpose is as individuals and as communities. When we start to read and study ancient myths, a question that often comes to mind is, did they really believe these stories? Did the Greeks or the Romans or any ancient culture, did they really believe in their myths? And how could they have believed in their myths?
And this is the title, actually, of a very famous and important book, Did the Greeks Believe Their Myths?, that talks just about that subject. I'm not going to try to reproduce the argument of that book, although I am drawing from it a little bit in this lecture. But really, when we're asking that question, it's not about did they believe in them or not. The question is really, what does it mean to believe in a myth or believe in anything? What does it mean to say, I believe in X? I believe that God created the world in six days, or I believe that Zeus struck down uh, someone with a lightning bolt. What are the different ways that we can believe in ideas or stories or concepts? In order to try to answer this question and explore what belief really means, let's proceed by analogy through another example. Let's look at how do modern Christians believe in the Bible? What are the different ways that modern Christians might interpret the biblical text and what does it really mean to them? And these different ways of believing are not strict, uh, differentiated, delineated theological philosophies. These are sort of nebulous and loosely connected. But I'm going to try to differentiate between some different attitudes, different approaches to the Bible as a way of understanding, by again by analogy, how the ancient Greeks, the ancient Romans, and people of any culture might believe in the different myths and what they might mean to them. As you're probably aware, there's a whole range of different ways that people believe in or interpret the Bible. And I've given you a very simple, very basic continuum from on one end, the literalist or fundamentalist view, to on the very opposite end, a more figurative or philosophical interpretation. And there's of course a whole host of different uh, positions between these two extremes. On the one extreme of the literalist or fundamentalist interpretation, this view tries to stick to the principle that everything in the Bible is literally true. If it says something there, that's exactly what happened. That's the truth. So every person that's described in the Bible actually existed. Every event that's described in the Bible actually happened and in the way described. So if it says that God created the world in six days, then that's literally the, the truth. That's literally the case. It took six days. If it says that someone lived for 900 years, then they actually, in fact, lived for 900 years. So this is, in some ways, a very simple um, uh, principle to grasp in terms of what it means to be a literalist or a fundamentalist when it comes to interpreting the Bible or any sort of scripture uh, religious text. One question that someone might raise concerning the literalist interpretation of the Bible is why is it that all these miracles and fantastic events and people living to 900 years old, why do we see these events in the Bible? How could they have been true then? Why don't those things happen now? Why are those things impossible now? And usually the way that's answered is that the biblical time was a kind of a special time. It was just completely different from modern time, that the modern world is somehow distinct, that God has somehow changed the way the universe worked. And so while we don't see these miracles and things happening now, they did really happen in this legendary once upon a time period that we still that is still believed to be true. Now, once we move away from the more literalist interpretations, we get into all sorts of different varying degrees of non-literalism. Um, and these interpretations are usually more concerned with the ideas that the stories are expressing rather than whether or not they're factually correct or not. So again, this is more about ideas than factual truth. Someone, some people who are not fully literalist or not fully fundamentalist, they might say some stories are literally true, historically true, they, they actually happened, the people are actual people that existed, but they might take many other stories in the Bible to be allegories or fables that are either intended to teach complex ideas that people had trouble understanding or are exaggerated for the purposes of storytelling. So for example, People who are not literalist in their interpretation might say that if it says someone lived for 900 years, it just means for a long time. 
Um, and if there's people like Noah, for whom we have no historical evidence outside of the biblical text, they might say, well, Noah probably didn't exist. Or maybe there was a Noah, but the story of the flood and the ark, those are exaggerations. What's more important is that the values that we learn from Noah of loyalty to God, of um, pursuing good morals, etc., etc. So again, non-literalist non interpretations tend to be more about values rather than factual truth. The challenge then becomes, how do you decide what's fact versus what's fiction? Well, often what people will do is interpret the text in light of modern science, modern history, what we know today, what we've learned about the past, and so forth. So they'll say that events and people that have objective evidence outside of the Bible are true. So we do have evidence that there really was a King David. Uh, we have evidence that there was a Herod. So these are things that are taken to be true, um, if not necessarily exactly as described in the Bible. Things that can't be verified historically outside of the Bible are interpreted as legends. So the Garden of Eden, the Flood, Abraham, the uh, Jews escaping from uh, Egypt and spending 40 years in the desert. These are things that we have no historical evidence for outside of the biblical text, so they're then interpreted as legends. And again, the idea is not that they're true, but what's the value? What are the ideas that are being expressed? And similarly, things that conflict with modern science are interpreted as allegories or fables or primitive attempts to understand reality. So again, the six days of creation, Modern science disagrees with that, so we take that as a fable, just a, a way to try to explain how did the world come about. The idea that all humanity is descended from two people, modern science says that's impossible, so again, it's interpreted as a story intended to communicate some value rather than something that's intended to be taken as factual truth. Now, whether or not someone is a literalist in their interpretation, whether or not they are only partially literalist, they take some stories to be true, others to be false, um, or if they're completely figurative in their interpretation, it's always impossible to insist on absolute consistency. And that's because all human belief systems, religious, non-religious, even the most scientific, are subject to contradictions and inconsistencies. And that's just because of the limitations of human knowledge and human perception. So even the most literalist interpretations of the Bible, well, they're plagued by the fact that there are inconsistencies in the text. And in fact, even people who are call themselves fundamentalist or literalist have differing interpretations. So there's two different account, att accounts of creation in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. Um, if you look at the different Gospels, they have differences in the way they talk about Jesus' life and, and the events in his life. On the other hand, those people who are non-literalist uh, are plagued by the inconsistency that they often will reject some supernatural events, but accept others. So many people will say, well, the six days of creation, that's obviously impossible, that's not true, but they might believe that, especially if they're Christian, that Jesus really did die and was born again, Jesus really did perform all these miracles, etc., etc. So there's an inconsistency there. And again, this is not to denigrate anyone's belief system, just to point out that all human beliefs have in inconsistencies in them. Of course, human beings don't like inconsistency. We like things to make sense. So we're always attempting to make our belief systems make sense, even if there's evidence to the contrary. So for those on the more literal side of interpreting the Bible, uh, how do they make their belief system consistent? Well, Oftentimes it's through selective reading. There is no one who emphasizes every part of the Bible to have equal importance. There'll always be some portions that they leave out. Um, and another way is a claim to divine enlightenment or individual insight. Well, I know that it's true because God has told me that. That's, what I, that's the message I've gotten from God. This is, of course, problematic because it's unique to them. It's not something that can be shared with others. For those who are non-literalist, 
oftentimes they'll attempt to reconcile the biblical text with modern science. So they might say, well, the six days of creation are equal to six uh, different geological ages or something like that. Perhaps one of the most interesting and extreme examples is the Jefferson Bible, written by Thomas Jefferson, that is the third president of the United States and the author of the Declaration of Independence. He compiled his own version of the New Testament. And what he did is he eliminated basically all the miracles, all the supernatural events, and all the references to Jesus as divine, making him instead just a very good person with a profound message about love and believing in goodness, etc., etc. So there's always these attempts to make beliefs consistent, and they perhaps never quite work out the way the believers want them to. And what's important about recognizing these different approaches, these different types of belief, different modes of belief, is that they all express different values. The way one interprets a scripture, a scriptural text, reveals what the people, what the believers hold to be important. So those people today who are strictly literalist, what they're asserting is that the text is the most important thing. The Bible itself, the Word of God, is paramount. That's what's most important. And that's why, in fact, literalism is really the most modern, the newest way of reading the Bible, because it's an explicit rejection of modern science, modern history, etc., saying, I don't care what we think we've learned, I know that this biblical text is the truth. Whereas those people who are more non-literalist or have some sort of mixed view, what's more important to them is not, again, that the text itself is true, but that the values that it expresses, that the community, the religious community that it helps us to create in the modern world, that's what's important. Whether or not these people existed or the events occurred, what's important are the values that are expressed, like loyalty, mercy, kindness, and so forth. So the different ways that one believes in something reveal what that person holds to be important. So the lesson here and the real core idea that I'm trying to get across is that we need to understand belief in a more complex way. Every individual, every one of us, you, me, everyone you know, we're capable of maintaining very complex and in fact even contradictory belief systems. We're capable of believing things in spite of evidence to the contrary, or in spite of contradictions within those belief systems. And what we believe in is not about really what's true or false, what's fact or fiction. That's not what's most important in terms of what we believe or why we believe. Our beliefs really reflect our values and how we understand the world around us. So it's more about us than it is about the reality outside of us. And so the, the basic message here, our beliefs don't emerge for, as an objective response to the world. We don't just look out at the world objectively and see what's happening and then have form our beliefs in response to it. Rather, our beliefs impose our understanding of truth on the world. If you believe in the literal truth of the Bible, you're going to impose that belief on everything that you see around you. If you do not believe in the literal truth of the Bible, then again, you're going to impose that system on the world around you and interpret everything in those terms. So with that in mind, let's ask the question again, did the Greeks believe their myths? Well, the short answer is yes, they did. The long answer, of course, to go back to what we've been saying, it depends on what you mean by believe. Now, when trying to answer this question, it's very important to think for a moment about the Greek philosophy of being, the Greek philosophy of reality. And this is going to seem perhaps very strange and even counterintuitive to our own understanding of reality, but there is a logic to it. Basically, Greek philosophy was founded on a, a fundamental dichotomy or fundamental division between something and nothing, or another way to put it, between existence, between that which exists and that which doesn't exist. Seems simple so far, 
Now this basic division between what exists and what doesn't exist then leads to a further conclusion, a further notion in Greek philosophy. What can you actually know about or talk about? Can you talk about things that don't exist? Well, no. You can only speak about, you can only know about something that is real, something that actually exists. And again, this, this is logical if we think about it, although perhaps put in terms that we wouldn't necessarily use, but it does make sense. You can only talk about something that exists. You can't talk about or know about something that's not there. So if we can only talk about something, something that exists, that means it's impossible to talk about nothing. How can you say something about something that doesn't exist? It's impossible. You can't talk about things that aren't there. And so, for example, this extends into other areas of Greek thought. In their mathematics, Greeks had no number zero. They were introduced to the concept of zero. They had seen it in their contacts with other cultures, but they it was very controversial for them. They didn't know what to do with this because by writing down the number zero, you're suddenly making a representation of nothingness. And how can you represent nothing? The number zero, just by writing it, you're making it into a thing. And that doesn't make sense. So for example, uh, to say, how many apples do you have? I have no apples. That doesn't really make sense in the Greek way of understanding the world. To say that you have nothing of something is a contradiction in terms. So we can see how this is starting to get a little strange. So how does this apply to myth? How does this apply to the stories of Hesiod and Homer? Well, according to Greek philosophy and their understanding that one could only speak about or write about things that actually existed, if something was spoken or written about, by logical necessity, it had to exist. If there's a story about a god, if there's a story about these heroes, there has to be some reality there. Now, again, this seems very strange to us because we have this idea of fiction. Well, I can write a story about a school of wizards even though no such thing exists. The idea of fiction doesn't really exist in Greek thought. If it's written about, there's some reality there. Now, it's important to step back for a second and examine this because by virtue of the fact that something was written about, just because someone wrote it down on paper, that means that there must have been some sort of existence, some sort of reality there. That doesn't mean that the ancient Greeks always accepted uncritically or literally what was written down. So they might have said, well, there is some reality to the notion of Zeus or to the notion of Hercules or whatever, but that doesn't mean that what was written was taken as the absolute truth or the literal uh, fact of the matter. So it's important to keep that in mind. And again, we're, so this is, we're getting into a very complex sort of understanding of belief and truth and reality that is in many ways radically different from our own understanding of reality. So what was the status of these mythical texts? Well, it's first we should realize that works like the Theogony or the Odyssey, they're not religious scripture. Even though they talk about gods and heroes, they're not considered religious scripture for the ancient Greeks in the same way that, for example, the Bible or the Quran are religious texts. They have a different social or cultural status for the ancient Greeks than these scriptural texts have for modern believers, modern members of these religions. Instead, these mythical texts were closer to popular stories like modern popular films, but about important legendary figures. So, and this is a very faulty analogy, but it's the best one that I could come up with. Imagine if we believed that the characters in comic books and comic movies were about real people, that there really was a Tony Stark, that there really was a Bruce Wayne, um, and that these characters existed somehow, even if we don't see them around today. Or another analogy, perhaps a little bit closer, imagine if people wrote popular films or comic books about the characters in the Bible. Imagine if there was a series of films about King David or a comic book series about the disciples of Jesus and their journeys spreading the gospel. 
that's closer to what these mythical texts were rather than actual scriptural religious texts that people look to for truth, for guidance, for the word of God. In terms of how the myths were interpreted, one challenge that we have is we really have no record of what Hesiod and Homer's contemporaries thought of their works. We don't have any texts from when they were writing or when they existed that tell us how people interpreted them. The earliest writings we have are usually from one to two centuries later. So they're from later Greek culture um, rather than Hesiod and Homer's actual lifetime from their contemporaries. So that's a challenge. We don't know how they were received in their own time, but we do know how later generations received them. We think it's probably reasonable to assume that there were people who believed in the literal truth of these myths. Um, and often the general sense is that this was probably people who weren't high status in society. So children, because of course children today believe in things like the Easter Bunny and the Tooth Fairy and Santa Claus. So many children probably believed in the literal truth of these myths. The uneducated masses, only a very small portion of society was educated. Um, so the uneducated masses might have had a more literal belief in these uh, uh, myths. And that also includes slaves, people who were captured from other cultures um, or people born into slavery who were uh, owned, who were the servants, and then, you know, therefore the lowest of the low in Greek society, they might have believed in the literal truth of these myths. And the reason for this is that there probably was a, a very good social and political reason to ensure that such people believe truthfully in these myths. It kept the lower elements of society under control. In many ways, the way religious belief has always been used to monitor, to control certain aspects of society. So there might have been some, there probably were people who believed literally in these uh, truths, but not the more educated, not the higher status people, we think. Now, to slightly contradict what I just said, there probably were periods in which there was a more literal acceptance, even among the higher classes and the educated, in the truth of these myths. Uh, but even in those periods, they made a very clear division between modernity, what, what was their time, modernity, and the past. So much like some people today will believe that, well, in the past, God was um, more directly involved in human affairs, but today God is uh, not involved. Um, there were people in the times of ancient Greece who believed that, well, we obviously don't see gods and heroes today. We don't see these monsters and so forth uh, in our everyday life. So why is that? Well, because there was a mythical golden age in which gods were more directly involved, human beings were more noble, heroic, powerful, and so forth. But in the modern world, the gods have retreated, humans are not as powerful. And why is that? The most common reason is because the world has declined in some way. And when you read Hesiod's works and days and theogony, you'll see Hesiod has a philosophy that the world and human beings have declined from an earlier greatness. Now, as Greek society developed and in some ways became more scientific or what we might call proto-scientific, uh, beliefs started to change and there was a more critical attitude towards myths that emerged. So many viewed that they were true, but there's an exaggeration. Again, because they were written about, there must be some existence to them. There must be some reality to these figures, but they were exaggerated. So the supernatural elements that we see in these stories, the belief was that they had been added over the years to make the stories more exciting, or they were added by people who were superstitious and so forth. So there's always a core of truth, and it's just been covered over by elaboration, by exaggeration. So Heracles, that is Hercules, um, really existed. There was a Hercules, but he wasn't the son of a god. He didn't do all these magical things, killing monsters and so forth, but he was just a mighty king and warrior. He was a very powerful person, and because of that, all these legends have grown up around him. And so this was one way that many critics and, and intellectuals in ancient Greece reinterpreted uh, the myths to find a core of truth that had been, again, overlaid with legend. Now, some people 
believed the gods to be real, right? And that, but they had just withdrawn their presence from the world because things had declined from the golden age. But others extended this idea that, well, there's a reality, but it's just been exaggerated to the gods themselves. The gods were really just real people who had been exaggerated by legends. So Zeus, rather than being the king of the gods, was just a great king from ancient days who had ruled over the entire world or some large portion of it. And the stories about him being a god had been exaggerated. It was part of propaganda. Um, the legends had been built up to exaggerate his glory over the centuries. Uh, on the on another another way of viewing them, they might be allegorical stories, lessons, again, much in the way that certain stories from the Bible are taken not to be truthful literally, but allegorical stories or lessons that are exaggerations meant to teach some value. So again, this is all based in that idea that there has to be some truth. There has to have been a Zeus because Zeus is written about, but the stories written about him are not necessarily factually correct. And then we get to perhaps the most abstract interpretation of gods, and that's the, and that's the philosophical interpretation, that the divine beings are really just metaphors for the primal forces of the universe. They're not real beings, but coded language that's to be interpreted by the knowledgeable. They've somehow been inspired by the universe to write these stories about Zeus and Kronos, etc., etc., but they're not real beings, but metaphors. So again, there's a truth there, there's a reality there. These aren't just lies, they aren't nonsense, but it needs to be decoded by the knowledgeable. So for example, in Hesiod's Works and Days, he talks about the two different forces of strife. And does Hesiod mean that these are literal beings that can be pointed at and looked at? Or is Hesiod talking about the concept of strife, the concept of conflict? Uh, and the works of Plato and Aristotle, they seem to have taken this approach, that the gods are really metaphorical in some way, while at the same time they refer to them um, by name, but these gods are not necessarily actual beings, but metaphors, figures for philosophical concepts. As I said earlier, there is a book that discusses this and that I've drawn my ideas from. I've really greatly simplified them and, and maybe even misrepresented some of the ideas in this book. But if you're looking for more information um, and you want to read something that's both fascinating and also quite challenging in its concepts, um, I highly recommend the book by Paul Vane, Did the Greeks Believe in Their Myths? An Essay on the Constitutive Imagination. It goes way more into detail on these ideas and it's a really fascinating and powerful book about how belief shapes the world around us and how even in the modern world, um, our, our ideas of the world are not so much about what's true, but about what we believe, how our own belief system, again, creates the world around us just as much as the Greeks belief system did. So I highly recommend this, although it is a challenging work. And, and if you um, want to read it, I'd love to discuss it with any of you who, who end up doing so. So just to review the most important concepts from this lecture, what is myth? Myth is not about truth or falsity. Myth is not about fact or fiction, but myths are culturally important stories. They're stories that are foundational to a culture and that communicate, transmit, and record their foundational values. So what are the myths that we believe today? in our world, in our society, in our different communities, whether it's our, your local community, your university, your country, your religious community, and what values do those beliefs express? And there are many different forms of belief, many different ways that someone can believe. Two people might believe in the Bible, but in very different ways. Two people might believe in science, but in very different ways. And of course, belief is always very closely related to our values. So think to yourself, what are your own religious beliefs or other beliefs, your political beliefs, etc.? And why do you believe them? Is it because that's what you were taught? Is it because that's what you've seen around you? Is it because of your experiences in the world and the way you've interpreted 
what's happened to you? Probably a mix of these things. And what do these beliefs reveal about your values, about what you think is important, about what you think is right or wrong? And finally, how do they actually affect your behavior? If you are a religious person, whatever your religion is, how does that belief manifest in your day-to-day -day life? If you're a scientifically minded person, how, does, how do those beliefs manifest in your day-to-day -day life? These can be painful questions, difficult questions to ask because they force us to really examine ourselves very closely and be critical about ourselves. But it's essential for you to ask these questions and think about them if you want to be a thoughtful person, if you want to be a person who really understands themselves and grows and changes and learns as you live your life. And just the next steps after you've watched this video, the next video for this week is uh, on Hesiod, uh, on Hesiod and the Theogony and Works and Days. Um, make sure that you complete the grading contract that's due on Friday and the reading journal for the first week that's due on Saturday. If you have questions about those, you can contact me or, or look on the website or syllabus uh, and make sure that you work on the quiz one, which is going to talk about cover Hesiod's uh, works. That's due Saturday and the first essay, which is due on Monday evening. And again, if you have any questions about anything in this lecture or anything else to do with the class, please feel free to contact me via email, phone, text, or Blackboard. And best wishes and good luck with your work for the rest of this week.